Your 
My name is Casey Timmons. My home church is St. John's Lutheran in Athol, Kansas, and I am a Christian. My parents are the reason that I am a Christian. They have been the driving force behind my faith in Jesus Christ. My parents took me to church and youth group, read the Bible to me, and talked to me about God. My faith was a gradual faith. I did not have a revolutionary moment or sob story that changed my life. I had an amazing childhood, and have countless blessings. The hardest part was accepting it as my own faith and not just accepting something my parents believed in. For the longest time, I felt like I wasn't good enough. I was too sinful. No matter how hard I tried, I always fell short of what I thought was the Christian standard. I felt I was just going through the motions of going to church, reading my Bible, and saying that I believed in something that I didn't know for sure was real. A year ago, I went to a Christian youth conference. One of the youth, youth pastors there had us write down a sin that was controlling our lives. I immediately knew what my sin was. That pastor showed us that it's okay to be sinful. We weren't made to be perfect. He showed us God could wipe away all of our sins. This was the first moment I felt God moving in my life. One of that pastor's main points in his message was God can make everything new and God can forgive everything that you've ever done. There is no one so terribly sinful they are beyond the reach of God's grace. One of the things I took away from that sermon was if we wanted God in our lives, we had to acknowledge that we were nothing without him. We had to go to God with our brokenness and admit that we needed him. God will not use someone who thinks they are too good for him. Since that day, I have grown a lot in my faith in Jesus. As a lot of you know, I worry and stress about everything. That's just my personality. Fear controls my life. I'm afraid of failure and being a disappointment. I'm afraid of coming out of my shell and letting people know the real me. But I'm learning to live fearless through my faith in Jesus Christ. I'm learning to use the power of prayer just by giving things to God and asking him to take care of it because I know that he can. There are a lot of times when I have been at an absolute low and I had to go to God in tears and ask him to make a way for me. He always does. Not always in the way I want him to, but I have to trust him and know that he has my life in his hands. I've been able to see him in everyday moments in my life. Not necessarily in big things, just small moments. Moments that some people may see as lucky or as a coincidence, but I see it as God. I am still growing in my faith every day. God is still refining me into the person he needs me to be. I struggle with ignoring him sometimes as life gets really busy and hectic with school and sports and a thousand other things going on. I'm guilty of just setting aside two hours Sunday morning for God instead of letting him be first in my life every day. I'll forget to pray and read my Bible and then I get to the point I ignore him until something stressful happens and then I decide I need him again. I've learned to accept my brokenness and know that I'm going to fail every day. 
I think a lot of people think that Christians are expected to be these perfect specimens of humanity when in reality we are just as sinful as anyone else. I am a cheater, I am a liar, I am a murderer, I am an adulterer. God still loves me despite my failures, and he loves you too. Every day I find myself doing things I know I shouldn't do, but I do it anyway. I have to figuratively go to the river and wash my robe in the blood of Jesus Christ and let God renew my soul. As I move on to bigger things in life, I know I am going to be attacked for my faith. It is going to be hard to keep that fire burning in my soul. But I find comfort in knowing that he who lives inside of me is greater than he who lives in the world. And that even though I feel like I'm fighting a losing battle every day, the cross has already won the war. I went to the same conference again this year, and one of the main messages was, as Christians, we are called to love broken people. That has been my goal every day, to love people so they see, see Jesus Christ through me. I see broken people walking down the halls of Smith Center High School every day. People with broken families or abusive parents or kids who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Even kids who look like they have it all on the outside, but on the inside they are hurting. My purpose is to love and show God's love to others. I need to be that shining light in the darkness. I may never know who I affect. I don't have to be a big influential person to do God's work. God will use small and weak people to show how strong and powerful he is. I have to remind myself that even though I may not be able to do much to help them, God can. There is no pain that he will not use and no one that he cannot rescue. He has a plan for their life and a reason he needs them here on this earth. As we are graduating and leaving high school, we all have these big plans for our lives. College, career, military, maybe even marriage and family. We all make plans. Even I have my own plans. Yet I know God can change those plans in an instant. We are on earth at this time for a reason. He has his own plan and purpose for our lives. Romans 8:28 says, God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. If we ask him to guide us, we can start this adventure in peace, knowing he has walked the path ahead of us and is surrounding us in his unfailing and merciful love. I encourage you, if you have not already done so, ask Jesus to be your personal Savior, to come into your life and guide you through your life's journey. It will be a, a decision you will never regret. Thank you. Thank you, Casey, for making that hard to follow. <laughs> I'd like to thank the Ministerial Alliance for uh, allowing me to speak to you tonight. You know, as I look back now, as this is our, my final few days here in the school, that high school is really kind of funny, if you think about it. All your friends that you meet when you come into this school, people you never knew before, people move in, you make new friends, your teachers, you get to know them on a personal level. Funniest thing is Mr. Kelsch, though. He's just a funny guy. I see you back there smiling, looking at me. All throughout life, we see that there are rules. Rules for everything. So as you're a child and you're playing with your brother, it's share your toys. I've heard that before, right, Mom? I think so. And then you get into high school, and it's the student handbook. You have to follow a dress code. You have to be at school on time. And then as you go into life, it's the law. Things you have to follow, like 65 miles an hour, and don't throw your trash out the window. So what happens if you don't follow these rules? If we don't obey, we'll get in trouble, right? Yeah, if you uh, litter, or you drive too fast, or if you go and steal your neighbor's watch because you think it looks pretty cool, you're going to probably go to jail. If, you know, I don't show up to class three times, I'm going to get a detention because uh, that's how the student handbook says that it'll go. And then if you're in trouble with your parents as a youngster, you're probably going to have to go sit in time out and think about what you've done. Our parents, teachers, family members, and people of the community, they might be disappointed in our decisions or our actions. In high school, like I said, if I showed up three times, I would have to have a detention late. If I didn't turn my research paper into Mrs. Molzon on time, I would get docked on my grade. Not that that has ever happened to me. 
And if I were to tackle my brother out in the front yard when I was a little guy, I might get a stern talking to and have to go to my room and think about what I've done. Now that may have happened to me a few times when I was growing up. But what are we losing when we don't follow these rules? Play time with your siblings, time after school that you could go do something that you want to do, or time as being a free citizen. Time, all three of those, losing time. What a valuable thing to lose as a person. As I stand here, I think, me standing here, I'll never get these seconds back. We never get high school back. It's time. Time you will never get to do over again. Ephesians 1.10 says, As a plan for the fullness of time to unite all the things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. A plan for the fullness of time. One of my favorite songs right now is titled Fast by Luke Bryan. I'm sure you've all heard it. Most of you have heard it. The chorus of the song goes like this. It says, 60 seconds now feels more like 30. Tick tock, won't stop, and round it goes. Sand through the glass sure falls in a hurry. And all you keep trying to do is slow it down. Soak it in. Keep trying to make the good times last as long as you can, but you can't. It just goes too fast. Now, Luke Bryan is trying to tell his listener that time is precious, like I'm trying to tell you now, that life is precious and you only get one life and you only get time once in your life. So enjoy the time that you have on this earth because it is very limited and we never know when it can be taken away. Now, most of you may know that I'm a very sports-minded individual. I follow all types of sports. So I like to relate topics to sporting events or scenarios. So we've all heard about the greatest comebacks in history, right? The team that pulls it off. Like the Kentucky Wildcats basketball team in 1994, they were down by 31 points with 15 minutes left to go in the second half against LSU, and they pulled it off. Rick Pitino, Kentucky's head coach, still doesn't know what happened. The Buffalo Bills in 1993, the Buffalo Bills beat Houston in the biggest NFL comeback in history, falling behind 35-3 to in the second half. Bills quarterback Frank Reich threw four touchdowns to lead the Bills back 41-38. to in 2004, the Boston Red Sox overcame a 3-0 series deficit to beat the Yankees in the ALCS en route to the World Series, which means they won four consecutive games. In 2001, the Duke Red Devils, uh, Blue Devils excuse me, basketball team trailed Maryland by 22 in the first half of the 2001 Final Four before mounting a 95-84 comeback victory. Coach Mike Krzyzewski told the Blue Devils during a timeout, you're losing by so much, you can't you can't play any worse. So what are you worried about? Losing by 40? And they came back and won the game. All these teams did something that seemed impossible to the viewers and everybody watching. I'm sure even the coaches. What about all those failed comebacks, though? I often think about this year's March Madness basketball tournament, where the UMBC Retrievers defeated the Virginia Cavaliers in the round of 64. This was the first time that a 16 seed had ever beat a one seed in the tournament bracket. Virginia was down by more points than you can ever imagine and gave a valiant effort to get back into the game by cutting the UMBC lead to 11. But it was too little too late as the Retrievers went on to win by 20 points, 74 to 54. Virginia almost did it. They almost pulled it off. But as I like to say, almost doesn't pay the bills. <clears throat> One can't say, I almost had enough money to pay rent this month. I'll just tell my landlord I'll live for free for a while. Life doesn't work like that. What if you were standing at, in front of God and he asked you why you should be led into heaven? Are you going to say, I almost did what I was supposed to do, but I just didn't have enough time? Time. There it is again. That dreaded thing that we all want more of every day. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. There's, one, there's only one kind of time that should matter to you, and that's the eternal time spent after this life in heaven. Don't be that person who tackles your brother in the front yard and misses out on playtime. Or the kid who shows up late to school every day so they have to spend their time after school missing out on their own life. Or the person that spends the majority of their time on earth in a cell not spending time with their families. Don't be the Virginia Cavaliers who waited too long to make a decision and missed out on a great opportunity. Instead, be the 1994 Kentucky Wildcats. I know for all you KU fans, that's hard to do. But make your decision now and live for the one true king. I promise you, it will be worth all of your time. Thank you.
Good evening. I would like to start by congratulating the 2018 graduated class of Thunder Ridge High School and the soon to be graduated class of Smith Center High School. It is my pleasure to be able to stand in front of all of you and share my faith journey. I've had several opportunities in recent years to share bits and pieces of my faith, mostly mission trip stories, but I have yet had an opportunity such as this to evaluate my faith throughout my 18 years of life. A few months ago when Pastor Emily Blank texted me and asked if I would be willing to be a student witness today, I was a bit hesitant. I thought, I really only have one awesome story about my faith that I could tell. So I asked if this story, which Emily experienced with me, would suffice as a speech. She said it would. So I didn't worry too much about putting any further thought into my speech because I'd shared this story before. But we all know that God oftentimes has other plans. In these last few months, I've caught myself thinking deep into my walk with God, and I realized that I have a much bigger story to tell than my mission trip experience. We're going to start at the very beginning of my story. I was baptized, raised, given my first communion, and confirmed at St. John Lutheran Church in Kensington. I have gone to Sunday school 